it all dealt with what what uh, what Lou Giglio what he what he uh, uh, brought to the forefront and how we praise and and worship God and the creation is praising and worshiping and and if you're my age and maybe some of you are a little younger but my age and older you remember Chris Christopherson he still is alive he's about 80 81 years old but um, in a in a in a low time in his life he wrote the song why me and we call it why me lord and i wanted to know a little bit of history behind this song because it may be tagged country but if you read the testimony that goes with it it's christian he wrote this song probably in the early 70s and he was uh, right down here in Cookville, Tennessee. And um, he was uh, there for a concert and a fundraiser. So I'm assuming it was Cookville or Smithville, one of the two, because it was for Dottie West, uh, the, the high school band. They were raising money for her band, so he was there. They gave the concert. After the concert, one of the ladies there invited him to come to church with her the next morning there in Nashville. That morning went to church. Long story short, he, he found himself at an altar. Didn't have a clue what he was doing there. Didn't have a clue he even need to be forgiven. But found himself weeping before the Lord. And the Lord gave him this song, Why Me, Lord? And the reason I'm bringing that out is I want to show you how far we have went in the wrong direction, even in our music that we praise and worship to. This song says, uh, uh, part of this song says, Try me, Lord, if you think there's a way that I can try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself on my way back to you. Now think about it. This is where the Lord began to deal with him. There's no way we can repay the Lord but a, but a heart and a mind that would want to repay God. Try me, Lord. If you think there's a way that I can try to repay. Boy, is that just not different today. Today, we need God to do for us. We need Him to do for our family. We, and we get a little upset if, if God doesn't do for us. And we need to pray that God help us, but we need to have a mentality not always about us, but even, Lord, what, what can I do? And if I can't repay you, then maybe I can show someone else what I've been through coming back to you. So today when we begin to, if we will learn how to approach our relationship with God through not only our praise and our worship, but also our striving to know Him through His Word, then we're going to be uh, less likely to miss the mark because the church is missing the mark today. Terribly, terribly bad. And, and, and I will tell you, with everything that's went on in this county, with our schools this past week, uh, we realize that we are, not, uh, um, we are not shielded from what we see happening all over the, the country. As, as now, I guess, for the first time that it's been made known publicly anyway, for the first time that, that we had a, had a, had a scare of, of danger in one of our schools, uh, and it was such an imminent danger, they even canceled school on Tuesday. Now, most of you heard that was because of the flu. Trust me, it was not because of the flu. It was because of threats that had come in over... Uh, a young young man that needs God, he needs prayer, he needs help, and hopefully he's getting that. But but saying things like have a 
have a plan to kill everyone you meet. And, and there was four or five other things that he was talking about with the gun, with um, uh, uh, even, even suicide and things of this nature. So I tell you, church, for several years I've been talking about these days are coming to us and they are now upon us. We can no longer think this is just going to happen in in Florida or California or Texas, but now in small Fentress County, Tennessee, we've had we've had our threat. Prior they arrested a boy in Livingston at the Livingston High School. Uh, uh, prior to that, in Meigs County and McMinn County. So it is here. And, and, and I believe this is one reason the Lord led me in this direction, because we are going to have to learn once again how to have a relationship with God and to learn how to praise and worship Him. So today I'm going to bring some of the praise and worship in and I'm going to bring some other things in that we need in order to fulfill the very purpose and plans that God has for us because the community needs you and I. They need men and women of God to be on the forefront and and give direction, give understanding, and surely be, be be backing with prayer what we must do and how we must handle these things. But today we've got a huge problem. I'm going to cover a, a lot of, of a little bit of a lot of things. And, and today we've got a huge problem, not only in the Western church, but maybe also in the church as a whole. And, and, and what I'm talking about as pastors and teachers, theologians, we've lost truth in modern day men and women of God. This morning in Sunday school, I, I was much quieter than normally. And Anne done, a, uh, uh, done an outstanding job teaching, and she's teaching in First Timothy, and and I quit counting after about ten times that she said Timothy as Paul, or Timothy listened to Paul, or Paul told Timothy this, or Paul said that, and and Timothy was very quick to hear. But I will tell you the problem that we have today, and honestly, I understand why we have a problem trusting with so much nonsense that's going on in the church. But not only in the church, but all this nonsense is business leaders, government leaders, our everyday men and women of God that don't even think twice about lying or covering up their own sin. No wonder we are not wanting to trust any longer, but that in itself creates a problem. See, we feel safe. Probably the laity never do this, but I will read sermons from 50, 100, 200 and more years back and, and trust these great men and great women of God and, and glean from them. But, but the problem is, is today we don't want to hear from anyone currently. And we say that we can't follow men. We can't. That's true. But God still has a word for us today. And believe it or not, God still speaks to men and women today. So we are going to have to learn to start trusting. We're going to have to learn to start discerning. Because God still has a word not only for you, but for the church. He still has a word for the government. He still has a word for education. God still has a word for the family. And whether you believe it or whether you listen, God is still speaking in 2018 through men and women. We must learn to discern. We must be, uh, uh, it, listen, if we don't learn to discern and start trusting 
then we're only going to know and believe what we think. And you're going to start missing some truths that God wants you to know. And worst case scenario is that you will be deceived by your own thoughts and your own ideologies. Now this is going to be a very hard obstacle to overcome, but we're going to have to do this because God is still speaking. Those 200 years ago do not have a word for what we are going through today. Now, God's Word covers it generally, but, and, and, and there's nothing new under the sun that is true. But God has promised that He would give us wisdom and knowledge for these last days, and, and it comes through men and women that He chooses as vessels to use. So we're not going to figure this out by ourselves. It's not going to happen. But there's a lot of people I would rather not listen to. We've got a problem. In Acts chapter 2, we see Acts chapter 2, we, the, the uh, feast day of Pentecost this year. We know it in the church history, the day that the Holy Spirit came and, and began to empower the people. We know it's the day that Peter, or that Peter preached his very first sermon and over 3,000 people got saved. We know it as that, but in the end of chapter 2, beginning around verse 40, we can find some characteristics there, some truths that I like to call them, that you and I can look at and glean from them and then put them in, in place today on how we learn to discern. Now listen at this. This is talking about a, a church growth, but it's talking about a, a, a healthy church. We'll pick it up in verse 40, chapter 2 of Acts. It says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Verse 46, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now I'm going to touch on some of these points. I'm not going to spend much time there. I'm going to try to hurry through this. But I will tell you, we need the points we find in this along with our praise and worship. Actually, if we don't find these points in a church, then our praise and worship is nothing but words that's going up that have no meaning to them. Not everyone that says uh, yes and amen or praise the Lord means it's praises going up to God. But praising God... God is easy. It's an emotional feeling that you and I have. We're emotional beings, so praising God can be very, very easy because it's just, it's just natural, it seems, to get caught up in the moment where you're truly worshiping and praising Him anyway to the best that we know how. But we're lacking if that's all we have. Because praise and worship will not grow you in Christ. But I'm going to take these simple points, 
Couple it with the praise and worship. Let this be the, the entire person. And then let's begin to see what it will do to the man or woman of God and overall the church. So right out of the gate, we see that, that Luke, Luke is the author of the book of Acts. We see right out of the gate, he's telling them the day of Pentecost has come. And now we see the church beginning to to, to take shape, and, and, uh, and, and, and Luke is making sure that they understand there's some characteristics that are going to be seen in a healthy church. And one of these, and I will tell you, as I go down the list, it goes from easy to hard. Well, it doesn't go from easy to hard. It goes from hard to harder to hardest. I will just tell you. So let's get to the hard one. That in this case would be the easy one, considering the points. So it's going to be hard. So, so this church will take on the learning. It'll be known by the learning of God's Word, but not only His Word, but His will. I wonder how many of you even know the will of God in your life. What God's will for you to be doing. Or are you just aimlessly walking? Remember, we can praise and worship. And if we don't, the rocks are going to cry out. But I will tell you, if we don't get this part, then our praise and worship is not going to have meaning. See how many of us are studying the Word of God. We can't get by without it. We must know what God's Word is saying to us today. So we must study it, we must learn it, and we must be marked by a person like the Bereans that were, that, that were known for, for studying the Word of God, but also the will of God in our life. Now, I could spend the rest of the time there, but I'm going to go on to the next one because the next one's a little bit harder than studying. We see this in verses 42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and what? Fellowship. You're going to say, Pastor, how is fellowship harder than studying the Word? I love to come together. I love to come together and we have chicken or we have hamburgers or we have this or we have that. I love to come together and we can share with the food and we can talk about the ball game and we can talk about this and we can talk about that. That is not the fellowship that Luke is talking about right here. He's not talking about getting together and just uh, uh, using mean, meaningless words and just really wasting good oxygen. No, he's talking about fellowshipping, coming together more than just eating or having a good time. But this word fellowship means a closeness, a sharing of a common bond, a feeling of togetherness, of belonging to each other, of belonging to the family of God. So that's hard for many of us. There's some of us, and I can be one of them, that can get in my little place at home, and if I'd ever came back out of it, I would probably be fine. And there's a lot of you that way, too. And a lot of you, many more of you are going to be that way if I tell you what we're not going to get together to do is just, is just eat and, and talk about nothing. But we're going to get together and we're going to come together for the purpose of, of, uh, uh, of being together, having a common bond, uh, uh, sitting down and talking to one another, caring about one another, uh, uh, sharing the good news to the ones that are around us that may not know the good news, maybe even the good news even to the Christians that have went wayward, encouraging one another, learning from uh, experiences from each other other, sharing victories, and comforting one another when we're having these problems. This is the fellowship that Luke is talking about. Now you understand why I said that that one's harder than studying. Because see, studying is just you and God. 
And I will tell you, any time it's just you and God is going to be a lot easier than you, God, and somebody else. Amen? It is. But these marks have, must be present just like they were in Acts. If we're going to be a church that is going to change society, because I will tell you that these problems that we're having just has a different name, but there's always been problems. The church has always had an answer. The church always could lead. That's the, that, that is the problem today. The church does not have an answer for this problem. That's why they're looking at taking guns, stopping the Second Amendment, doing this, doing that, building, building something to go in our schools where you have nothing but a box. You can just walk in. And you, there's no way of getting outside that box. Or we arm our teachers or we, we, we lock our, 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 our teachers and the students in their classrooms. I, I know that we need to come up with something, but we can't come up with anything that sounds like it's going to work because we have two. God out of the school. So therefore, the church is not leading. All the church is doing is coming together and, and, and offering a time of maybe praise and worship, maybe the Word, maybe prayer, which leads me to the third one. Now, we, we go from hard, harder. Now, we're going to just a little bit harder now than fellowship. Because it, it has to be included. We see in the Word of God, in verse 42, again says, And they steadfastly, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayer. Oh. There's that dreaded prayer. Now that one's harder than study. And it's harder than fellowship. Do you know why prayer is hard? And I, I said in the early service, I wasn't going to say it in this service because it's being taped. And I didn't want the whole world to hear me say this. But do you know why prayer is hard? It's boring. Michael told me the other day that somebody from Guatemala tuned in and listened to one of my sermons. So if you're listening today, don't leave yet because I'm going to clean that statement up. But let's be real. Is it boring? Because if it wasn't boring, we would all be doing it. So we have to ask, it shouldn't be born. Why is it boring? Because our prayer has been limited to a checklist. Okay, pray for Pastor Roger, Pastor Moses, pray for Church of the Harvest, Cornerstone Church, pray for the government in America, pray for the government in India. And we got a list, and a list is good to have. But if all you have is a list, it's going to get boring. I shared with them in the early service. And I know I'm not the only one that's done this. But I have good intentions and I really get down. I've got my list and I'm going to pray. And I pray to all that list and I come to whose name? Christy Hunter's name. So I'm praying for her. Why? Because she comes to church here and I feel like I need to pray for her. Well, then I remember she's getting ready to have a baby. So I began to pray for her. Okay, Lord, and now her baby. Lord, keep this baby safe. So next thing I know, my mind's wandering a little bit, and I think, you know, I wonder if she needs any clothes for that baby. She's already got that taken care of. So now my mind goes from uh, clothes to, well, you know what? They may be having a sale at Walmart, and for you know it, I, am, I, I, I have completely left God, and I'm praying about stuff that, that has nothing to do with nothing. I'm not saying you're nothing, Christy. But if we will, see, we've been told all our life there's a certain way that we can do this, that, or the other. You know, this is the way it works, okay? You either pray, and then you read your Bible. Or, if you're liberal, you'll read your Bible and then pray. But what about this? What about not worry about how it happens? 
Maybe you, you, you will do it like me and, and flip a song on and the next thing you know, it turns into a time of praise and worship which leads me to prayer which takes me right to the Word of God. Amen. However it works for you. But prayer is going to have to be in this mix. Without it, if you are a person, and folks, uh, I believe it's Barnett says the average pastor prays five minutes a day, then God help us what the laity is doing. And if you're not praying, forget it. You are not. You will never know the will of God for your life. And you will never know the power of God if you are not praying. So we got to go on because I'm going to hurry up. So after prayer, because I've got this one and one more, we get one that is just a little bit harder than prayer that must be evident in the church, and that is taking action, doing something. So we want to be like the wise builder that not only heard, but we did. We was also a doer of the Word. So that means we get up. In other words, we've got a huge problem in this county that we have got to take action. And many of us don't want to do that because we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do because we don't, we've not been praying. We've not been praying because praying is boring. See how it just gets out of control? Now, I'm not pointing at you. God gave me this message. This is for me, the pastor. But I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to go on and I'm going to finish with this one. And you're going to think, Pastor, this one is not... This one is not the hardest one of them all, but I think it is, in my opinion. A mark of a healthy church is it will be full of joy. Why did I put that at the very end? Because there is no joy in the church today. Very little. My goodness, I, I'm watching Christians. They are constantly bombarded with problems and can't seem to find any joy in their life. And joy is not absence of problems. Joy is, in, is having joy in spite of them. But why did I put it on the end? Because now let me tell you what it's done. I was informed this week, and I'm, I'm assuming it's probably true, that now even our, our kids that are Christians, or at least in a Christian home, they, st they begin to have problems in their life, and they start contemplating suicide and that student after student this is this is not uncharacteristic it's not the exception this is almost becoming the norm in many of our kids that are contemplating suicide where did they get that idea from they may have not have gotten it from their parents but if they're if they're from a Christian home, somebody, something in the church, some people in the church is, is, is not showing them that there's any joy at all in serving God. That there's no joy if I have problems. There's no joy if, if, uh, if things are going my way, not going my way. That, that if I'm not happy and bubbly all the time, that, then, then I just... I'm just walking around, woe is me, and, and I don't have a word for no one. And see, what we've got to do is, first of all, we need to stop dead in our tracks and get our heads straight. Because Jesus Christ 
came and gave his life that you may have abundant, eternal life. He doesn't need to do one other thing for you or me, and we need to get our head right that because of that, we should have joy unspeakable and full of glory. And start showing there is joy. You don't have to be happy about what's going on in your life. But the Spirit of God that's in each one of us will birth joy if we will just allow it. Christy, come on, because I'm going to end with the song. I told Terry, I said, I didn't want you to cut your songs back. I'll take it from, I'll take it from my part. That's why you didn't think I'd preach sermon this short, did you? Folks, we do not want the rocks and the whales and the moon and the stars to cry out in my stead. can't have it but I'm telling you if we do not have a relationship with Jesus if the only relationship we have is what he needs to be doing for me there's a good chance the rocks are crying out on your behalf